Hey guys, Dr. Childs here. Today we're going to be talking about Hashimoto's thyroiditis. More specifically, we're going to be talking about 10 foods that you should avoid if you have Hashimoto's thyroiditis. If you have Hashimoto's, then you probably already know that it is a two for one condition, meaning those people who have Hashimoto's have both a thyroid condition as well as immune dysfunction disorder. So Hashimoto's is really the combination of these two things. Now, when it comes to food, you can actually impact one or both of these systems based off the food that you put into your mouth or the food that you happen to avoid. And specifically today, we're talking about the foods that you should not put into your mouth because they negatively impact either your, either your thyroid or they impact negatively your immune system. All right, so with that in mind, let's jump right in. The first thing that we're gonna talk about today is gluten. Now, gluten is not so much a food group itself, right? It's actually a substance found within several types of food, um, like wheat and barley and rye and things like that. The reason that, we, that I'm recommending that you avoid gluten has to do with how that impacts your gut. So gluten as a molecule can actually have a pro-inflammatory effect on the gut and the gut lining. And as somebody who has Hashimoto's thyroiditis, you want to avoid anything which is going to be pro-inflammatory inside of your body. Now the term pro-inflammatory just means that it, it encourages inflammation. It encourages more of that inflammatory process in the body. And so you want to avoid foods which do that. In the case of gluten, there are two ways that it can occur. Number one is through the autoimmune disease known as celiac disease, right, which can often coincide with those patients who have Hashimoto's. The reason being if you have one autoimmune disease, you're much more likely to have a second. And the other way that it can impair or cause inflammation is if you have a sensitivity to it. And the condition for that is known as non-celiac gluten sensitivity. Both of these conditions can result in that inflammatory state and both conditions um, can cause gut damage and also encourage or lead to further autoimmune disease. So you wanna be very careful about avoiding gluten because there's two pathways to having that pro-inflammatory state um, I personally recommend that you avoid gluten if you have Hashimoto's for at least 90 days, whether you have or not. And a lot of people haven't given it a fair shot. So I'd strongly recommend that, that you do avoid gluten if you haven't already, because a lot of people, um, I've seen from personal experience, a lot of people see improvement simply by removing gluten out of their diet 100% for about 60 to 90 days, but preferably, preferably up to that 90 day mark. Okay, so that's number one. Number two is iodized salt. If you have Hashimoto's, you might be one of those people who is kind of afraid of iodine, right? There are a lot of people who believe, uh, wrongly I would point out, that consuming iodine is somehow dangerous for uh, those people who have Hashimoto's thyroiditis. This is not true, okay? I've debunked this in previous other videos and blog posts and so on. So if you are still within that mindset, please go check those videos out. It will explain why that is not the case. It is, however, the case that you should avoid iodized salt because of a different reason. And that has to do with the fact that it's more difficult to control how much iodine you're consuming each and every day if you are getting it in your salt. Because if you, you know, do a couple shakes of salt onto your food, how much is that? Like, uh, you know, it's very hard to quantify how much you're actually putting on your food and how much iodine is actually found in there. If you wanna complicate this further, there are also many salts, especially Celtic sea salt and Himalayan pink salt, which don't even contain iodine, right? So if you're trying to calculate how much iodine you're taking in every single day, it's very difficult to do that. In addition, when you get iodized salt, that iodized salt does not come protected with other nutrients, which are thyroid protective, and those include things like selenium and zinc. So if you're consuming a high amount of iodine, you're not really calculating how much, um, and you're not consuming it with the thyroid protective ingredients such as selenium, you're setting yourself up for potential thyroid gland inflammation. So it is a good idea to avoid iodized salt for that reason. It is not a good idea, however, to completely avoid iodine for other reasons which are sort of outside the scope of this video. That's number two. Number three would be dairy products. Now, when it comes to dairy products, we want to, the reason we've included it here is because a lot of patients with Hashimoto's thyroiditis, especially women, have a problem with the metabolizing of dairy products. Dairy has two different ingredients that can cause issues. One is the actual sugar or um, like lactose in this case, and the other one would be proteins, including things like casein. And the way that these uh, different compounds interact in your body and cause issues are slightly different, but they both lead to inflammation. In the case of lactose, if you're lactose intolerant, for instance, you have a lot of gut, um, uh, gut symptoms. So when you consume lactose, you might experience things like bloating and gas and abdominal pain and so on. When you consume uh, dairy products that have casein and you're reacting to the casein as opposed to the, the lactose, that causes a whole different set of symptoms, including things like acne or runny nose or allergic rhinitis and symptoms that kind of uh, are similar to hay fever or something like that. And we don't exactly know how they're causing problems, but we do know that they're interfering somehow with the immune system. And again, there's no reason to interfere with the immune system or take something that can potentially cause problems with your immune system if you already know that your immune system has issues, which is the case if you have Hashimoto's thyroiditis. So uh, for that reason, dairy products should be avoided. 
Um, in addition, you might find that certain dairy products uh, you can tolerate better than others. So there are some people, this, this is a, a wide spectrum here. So there's some people who can't tolerate liquid dairy products, but can tolerate things like cheeses and more solid dairy products. You just sort of have to play with it and figure out um, what works best for your body. But we do know from studies that Hashimoto's patients who completely avoid dairy have seen, or at least in several studies have seen, an improvement in their thyroid lab tests, including a normalization of the TSH and improvement in free T3 and free T4 levels. So keep that in mind. Number four would be soy products. Now the reason we don't want, or the reason I'm recommending that you avoid so soy products is actually for several reasons. The first being that most soy products are highly processed. And we're gonna talk about highly processed foods in just a second here because that is on the list. But in general, it's a good idea to avoid anything that, that undergoes a high degree of processing before you actually stick that thing in your body. But secondly, soy also is considered a goitrogenic, okay? Now, a goitrogen means that it blocks the uptake of iodine into your thyroid gland, all right? And that's not something you want to occur if you are somebody who already has thyroid function or problems with producing thyroid hormone. So remember, I said in the very beginning that some foods interfere with your thyroid and other foods interfere with inflammation or the immune system. In the case of soy, it's probably more interfering with the thyroid function itself by blocking iodine uptake into that gland. Now the degree to which it's goitrogenic is sort of up to up to uh, or up in the air. We don't we don't exactly know, but for most people, it still can potentially cause a problem. So I com I recommend generally that you do avoid soy if you have Hashimoto's thyroiditis. There will be some people who can avoid soy, or, or I'm sorry, who can consume soy though, especially if you find a non-processed version, so like an organic or um, non-GMO or you know l uh, minorly processed version or, or source of, of soy. So you can potentially get away with it if you look for that sort of. Uh, if you look for a soy in that case, but I, for most people, it's better to just some completely avoid it. So in the case of gluten, dairy, and soy, those are three big things that a lot of people will recommend that you avoid uh, if you have Hashimoto's, and I'm reiterating that here as well. Number five is coffee. Okay, coffee um, is something that a lot of people like, all right, and every time I talk about coffee, somebody gets mad at me, but th it's just the case that I, I, th I believe, and uh, based off studies that I've read, coffee tends to be damaging to the thyroid gland and thyroid function itself. So it's not really an immune aspect here, but more of a thyroid function here. So we have studies that show that taking coffee can actually have a suppressive effect on the brain, so the brain-thyroid connection is somewhat limited or suppressed in this case, which reduces free, free thyroid hormone concentrations. Number two, coffee can also reduce how much thyroid hormone you are absorbing if you take it as a medication, all right? So that's another reason to potentially avoid coffee. And the reason that occurs is probably a little bit different but similar to um, the, how it impacts thyroid function, and that has to do with the kinetics of the bowel. So if you increase how quickly your bowels are moving, you're going to, um, your thyroid medication is going to spend less time in the bowels and therefore less will be absorbed. So that's another potential consequence. And the third is that consuming coffee does put a little bit of strain on your adrenal glands or your cortisol levels. And so what happens is somebody who has low thyroid function is also gonna have some degree of cortisol issues. And if you take coffee on top of that, it's sort of compounding um, that problem. And it can actually lead to things like adrenal fatigue um, and cortisol imbalances. So be aware of that if you, if you are a coffee lover. Um, in the case of, I get a lot of questions that'll ask me, well, what about decaf? I still recommend av avoiding decaf. I just think people do better, uh, especially if they have Hashimoto's outside, or uh, especially if they have Hashimoto's, which is completely avoiding coffee altogether. So that's my recommendation if anyone has that question. Number six is alcohol. Alcohol is really a no-brainer, um, okay? Alcohol should be more of considered a poison, especially to the thyroid gland and especially to the liver, two systems which are incredibly important for thyroid function. It doesn't tend to impact immune um, uh, the immune system that much unless you're consuming quite a bit. All right, it can get to that point, but in the beginning what it can do is it kind of alters the way that uh, liver metabolism works, which is an important site of T4 to T3 conversion for your thyroid, as well as acting as a, a suppressant to thyroid function directly in the thyroid gland itself. So uh, take it from me here, avoiding alcohol 100%. You, you, you probably already know that, but I'm just reiterating it here as well. Number seven would be processed foods. So this is more, this is less a food and more of a grouping of foods, all right? And what I mean by process would be any food which undergoes modification prior to when it is first picked or um, let's say, let's say uh, you're, you're using something that has been um, like an apple or something and before it gets put on the shelf, it undergoes some, some or one or more steps which modifies its appearance by either the addition of preservatives um, or adding uh, flavor enhancements or um, adding fats or oils or sugars to it or whatever it is. But the idea is that this processing allows the food to have a longer shelf life, but at the cost of adding additional things which can be damaging um, and potentially pro-inflammatory inside of the body. In addition, this processing also tends to come with 
a lot of refined sugars, which we're gonna talk about in a second, and a lot of bad inflammatory fats. And then preservatives you don't want in your body as well. Um, so that whole process, even though it can be good in the sense that it's prolonging the shelf life, it's often bad and pro-inflammatory to patients who have Hashimoto's thyroiditis. So anything that is processed, and by process I just mean, um, you know, you should be able to look at the food and tell what it is. So in the case of an apple, if I hand you an apple, you know, you look at the apple and you could say, there's an apple here, right? There's, there's nothing else to it. But if you get a TV dinner and I, I you know, held that up to you, what's in that? I mean, you, you don't know. You can, even reading the ingredient list, it's a, a whole list of chemicals and other things which are obviously not apples or foods or bananas or things like that. So it's a real easy way to tell if something is processed or not simply by looking at the ingredients that compose that product, okay? And you should be able to, first of all, pronounce every single word that's there, and you should be able to just intuitively know that this is food, right? So anything that isn't obvious right off the bat is probably processed and probably something that you should avoid. All right, number eight, which is kind of a, kind of a um, segue from processed food, but this is processed sugar, okay? And so what I'm talking about um, are, well, I'll talk about it in just a second. The reason I'm recommending against processed sugars um, is not because sugars have a, a definitive negative impact on the thyroid. In fact, there never have been any studies which show that consuming sugar will cause thyroid dysfunction. That's not the case. However, we do know that excessive consumption of sugar and foods or, or processed foods which contain high amounts of sugar do have a negative effect, effect on the weight and insulin levels and blood sugar. And those three things can be associated with an inflammatory state. And so any sort of, any sort of state which encourages or causes inflammation is going to, number one, weaken the immune, immune system further and also interfere with thyroid function through by the inhibition of T4 to T3 conversion. So if you're using anything which is causing more inflammation downstream, even if it's not direct, it still will have a negative impact on the thyroid and should still be avoided. Now that does not mean, however, that you need to avoid all sources of sugar. I am not saying that. In fact, I am actually a proponent of consuming a moderate amount of sugar, especially for th patients who have Hashimoto's thyroiditis and patients who have thyroid disease sort of in general. I think there's been a shift to too much fat in, at, at the exclusion of sugar, um, almost to its detriment, okay? So what I do recommend is avoiding processed sugars, sugars that are found in the processed foods, which is why we're avoiding those, but do use in moderation natural sources of sugars, including things like honey, maple syrup, agave nectar, and coconut sugar in small amounts, right? You don't wanna consume these every single day for every single meal, but on occasion they are perfectly fine. And I think they're actually helpful for a lot of thyroid patients who are neglecting carbohydrates in general, more in favor of that sort of keto carnivore lifestyle sort of thing. So that's processed sugar. Number nine would be inflammatory oils. Now, I personally believe that inflammatory oils are a huge source of chronic disease in, our, in our today's world. I think that we can blame a lot of chronic diseases specifically on these inflammatory oils because they're not really oil. They're sort of sold to you um, as a patient that this is some sort of healthy vegetable oil, right? That's kind of what they're called. But they actually undergo multiple steps of processing in order to get whatever the oil is that looks like when, we, when you purchase it from the store. So there's a whole list of these oils which should be avoided. I'm gonna go over them now and I'll explain a little bit more why you wanna avoid them as well. So the list of oils to avoid, these are things that you do not want to consume, would be soybean oil, peanut oil, corn, safflower, wheat germ, canola, sunflower, cottonseed, grapeseed, and rice bran oil. These are all considered industrial seed oils, which will some kind, sometimes go as, or sometimes be hidden as the name vegetable oils. And these are the ones you want to avoid completely. Now, one of the reasons you want to avoid these is because they are a fat. Now, why is that important to you? Well, when you consume a fat inside of your body, it tends to be incorporated into the cellular structure. So there's this phospholipid uh, membrane that covers each and every cell, and certain fat molecules are required to, for the structural integrity of that cell. So when you consume something, it can either get hidden in that phospholipid um, layer, or it can actually be hidden in your fat cells. So something that is not uh, that can cause inflammation gets stuck inside your fat cells and sort of secretes out and, and sits there, sitting inside your body, causing and wreaking damage through, that, through its inflammatory effect over time. And it can take months and months and months to rid yourself of these things. So avoiding the, these pro-inflammatory industrial seed oils is very important in favor of healthier versions of oils, which I'll recommend now. So there's a couple that you just wanna consume. These tend to be the best. So extra virgin olive oil, coconut oil, butter from grass-fed cows. And I will include coconut oil in here, or I'm sorry, not coconut, avocado oil. It can be used sometimes. In general, I'm not a huge uh, fan of it, but, but that's another potential alternative, especially if you're cooking at you know, a little bit higher heats, because uh, the problem with extra virgin olive oil is that it's hard to cook at higher heats with because um, it can degrade at those temperatures. So you can throw some of those in there. It's still better than using canola oil, uh, for instance, um, but it was not as good as, let's say, extra virgin olive oil or coconut oil. So do keep that in mind. Definitely avoid these inflammatory oils. And you will notice that the problem with processed foods is not necessarily the processing itself, but the fact that it also contains 
processed bad fats and processed and refined sugars. So by getting the processed foods, you're also getting a, a combination deal, which comes with all these additional bad things that you want to avoid entirely. And then number 10, we're on the last one here, and that is raw vegetables. So hopefully your, your ears are perked up a little bit because uh, raw vegetables are not necessarily something that should always be avoided, but I want you to be aware of the potential problem that they can cause um, for patients who have Hashimoto's. Now, certain vegetables are high in goitrogens. And if you remember, as we talked about uh, throughout, throughout this video, I mentioned that soy has a goitrogenic effect. And so, so too do certain other vegetables. Um, included on this list would be things like broccoli and Brussels sprouts, um, kale, and so on. So in that family of vegetables, these all have goitrogenic potential. Now, the goitrogenic potential in these vegetables is not very high, okay? So I don't want you to be scared after listening to this and, and avoid all vegetables, but I want you to be aware that if you are consuming a vegetable which has a goitrogenic impact, that is going to influence how much iodine you should be taking. So if you are somebody who, has, who is taking a low amount of iodine because you were told that Hashimoto's patients should avoid iodine, then, then if you consume more vegetables, you will have a problem. So the more iodine you consume, the more vegetables you can consume because there's, no more, there's less competition uh, for the iodine and the goitrogens get, allowing that iodine to get inside your body or inside your thyroid gland in this case. Um, if you wanna completely not have to worry about this, there are certain things you can do to vegetables to allow or to reduce the goitrogenic impact that they can have. And that includes boiling them or steaming them. Now, unfortunately, that process also reduces some of their, the, the beneficial nutrients found inside of these vegetables, but it's better to get rid of those goitrogens and then also get the benefits. Or, you know, you'll lose some of those nutrients, but you'll still get the benefit of the vegetable and it'll be a, it'll be a, a net positive in the end. So for most people though, this is not an issue, but I at least wanted to throw it in there because I have seen some confusion about it lately. So I think it's helpful to include it. So the bottom line is if all that was a little bit confusing, do eat your vegetables. Um, and if you feel like you're worried about it because you're not consuming a lot of iodine, then the answer is to boil or steam your vegetables and that should solve the problem. So that is the list. That's all I have for you guys today. That is the list of 10 food groups that you should avoid if you have Hashimoto's thyroiditis. If you have um, avoided these in the past, I wanna hear from you. So leave your comments below if you have any questions. Tell me about your experience if you've avoided them. Have you seen any improvements in your Hashimoto's as a result of that? And if you haven't already, make sure that you download my free thyroid PDF resources. I have tons of information just like this, all designed to help thyroid patients like you feel better. So make sure you do that. And that's all I have. So otherwise, I'll see you guys in the next one.